Praise the Lord, everyone. I've been so blessed already just feeling the sweet, sweet presence of the Lord. I am so thankful to be here. I have been blessed by being here, and I thank God for each of you, my sisters, that I'm going to spend eternity with. It's an honor, Sister Trammell, to have you here today. I honor our First Lady, love her so much. She and Brother Trammell are leading this district in the power of the Holy Ghost, and I thank God for their willingness to sacrifice to lead us. I thank you, Sister Bollinger. It's, you know, you bump off people at camp meeting, you smile, you know their names and whatever, but it's been such a joy. Just she's been my, I get lost in large bathrooms. I really do. I can't find my way around anywhere. So I asked her if she'd please pick me up at the motel to make sure I got back and forth right. So she's been picking me up and we've been riding in the car together. And just that little bit of fellowship, just getting to know her better. And we're going to have lunch together. It's, it's just so wonderful to, to just glean from each other as iron sharpeneth iron so the man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends the bible says and when i sought the lord about today he made it very clear to me what he wanted us to talk about so my subject for today is living in stress or living in rest okay i'm gonna say it with me living in stress or living in rest well, that's what we're going to talk about. Now, I wish I could hear from you because I'm sure you've got some wonderful things that you do that help you, and I'd like to hear you, but she asked me to talk today, not you, so I'm going to tell you my stuff. <laughs> I'm going to tell you some of the ways that I just practically try, everybody say try, try. to live in rest. i got a question for you. For 20 years, we led the quiz ministry. My husband wrote 3,400,000,000 zillion questions for quizzers, and uh, so we're into when we study the word, writing questions visually impaired excuse me I'm gonna get rid of him there we go that works better okay so I have a question for you <clears throat> this question is worth a zillion points how many times is the word rest mentioned from Hebrews chapter 3 verse 11 to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 11 anybody want to guess it's worth a zillion points might as well give it a stab 25 oh no, she overshot it a little bit Thank you. Somebody's really smart. Okay. See, 311 to 411, it's mentioned 11 times. Isn't that easy to remember? Okay. We're going to look at just one verse, and that's Hebrews 4, 11 in the Amplified Bible. I'm going to read it. Lord, I always personalize the scripture. It says in the scripture to be zealous, and I say, Lord, help me to be, there's six things we're supposed to do here, to be zealous, to exert myself, to strive diligently, and enter the rest of God, to know it and experience it for myself. Six verbs. I have a habit when I'm studying scripture. I like to circle the verbs. It's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be zealous. I'm supposed to exert myself. I'm supposed to strive diligently. I'm supposed to enter the rest of God. I'm supposed to know it and experience it for myself. Now, that's what God wants us to do. Now, that's a whole bunch of work to get in that rest place. And the truth is, you do have to strive diligently. You have to exert yourself. You have to actively proactively go after it every day if not you will live in the state of stress yes. instead of the state of Michigan how do I do this Luke 18 8 says the Lord proverbially was asking when the Son of Man comes back will I find faith on the earth okay so he's asking this question uh, wondering so that lets me know it's gonna be in short supply if he was wondering if it was gonna be in left when he got back faith is gonna be in short supply Second verse, Hebrews 11 and 6, without faith, we all know it's impossible to please him. So in other words, I've got to have faith. Number three, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, I should study my, to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. I used to feel badly going around urging women so strongly to, to be students of the word because I thought, well, I probably just study a lot because I'm called to teach, I'm called to preach, and I, I should do that. This scripture says we should study to show ourselves to be approved, a workman doesn't just say a preacher or a teacher or a prophet or whatever. A workman. Every one of us need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. And the fourth scripture is Hebrews 11, 6. And we know all these. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Put this whole scenario together. I have got to have faith and faith and more faith to survive in the end time. Okay? My faith is in exact proportion to how much of this word I know I love, I understand, I believe, and I live. It's no mystery. 
the people that you know that you deem as having the greatest faith, they have so much of this word in them. They know it. They love it. They live it. They believe it. They quote it. They memorize it. You want to have more faith? Get more word. It's just that simple. You know, when I was, uh, uh, my dad was president of Gateway College back in the early 70s, and I had already graduated from ABI. I was going to secular college, and I was engaged to my husband. He worked for headquarters, and he was setting up campus ministry on the East Coast. And back in those days, most of you are not, you're like a server like me. We've got a few young people like Larissa and whatever, don't know. But back in those days, there was no email. There were no cell phones to communicate with another human being in another city. You had to call long distance. Or you had to write them a letter. You actually got out a pen. You wrote it on paper. You put it in something called an envelope. And you had to stamp it. You had to lick and stick on it. It was called mail. Okay. So that's how he communicated with me was through mail and letters. And every night when I got home from my job, I would, I would know in the mailbox there was going to be a letter from my husband. Now, it was not difficult for me. He wrote me every day. It was not difficult for me at the end of a long, I worked two jobs, actually, and was going to college, so I was tired. But it was not difficult for me to have to, mom didn't say, you better read that letter from our, oh, I guess I better, oh, my God. Honey, are you kidding? I'm ripping that thing off, walking in the house. We're engaged. I'm reading that. He's talking. I'm out on the East Coast. I went so-and-so and set up a campus ministry, and every man had got the Holy Ghost. And what I'm reading, oh, that's good. Hallelujah. God bless him. That's wonderful. But I knew there's some paragraph near the end where he was going to say, it's only 32 days until we get married. I can't wait to hold you in my arms. You've got beautiful brown eyes. I love you with all my heart. Woo! Hallelujah. I got out my highlighter. Honey, I'm a highlighting that. I'm a memorizing that. I'm quoting it. I'm working it there, checking out people. And I'm, ooh, I'm thinking of his words. They're going over. They're thrilling me. 66 love letters. 66 love letters. Don't you know it stresses him to the max? My God, I've got to read a verse. I've got to read a chapter. Jesus, help me. I know. Psalm 117 only got two verses. I've read that thing so many times. You've got to do better than that. You've got to have a plan. You've got to systematically feed yourself. And I know you're all women of the word, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. But anyway, we talked last night about <clears throat> the path of the word. Going from our mind to our heart and out of our mouth. It has to go from your mind to your heart and out of your mouth. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I'm not sinning. And see, got to get a bunch of word in your heart so you can get it out of your mouth. It's your only offensive weapon. It won't do just to come out of the preacher's mouth. It's got to come out of your mouth. <clears throat> so in other words, to get this word inside of us, we've got to have a plan. Read the Bible through in a year. You can study a book. You can study a topic. You can study a character. It doesn't matter. Just have a plan. Get your tools together. I like to keep mine in the summer in a basket or in a bag. <clears throat> in the winter, I have to always pray in the prayer room, obviously. Cause, but I love being outside, so I, I get it mobile so I can take it with me. Got my Bible in it. Got my journal. Got my songbook. Got my marker. Got my pen. I'm ready to go. I'm going to study. I am going to read the Word of God. You've got to have a time to do it. If you don't have a time to do it, it'll be midnight. Oh, my God, Lord, I'm so sorry. And you're too exhausted to, to do it. So make it a priority in your life. I have a habit when I read the Word every day. Personally, I've never gone to the Word with the sole intent of, oh, my God, I've got to preach somewhere. What am I going to say and go look for something? I don't do that. I study these 66 love letters so I can know my lover better. That's my whole intent. I want to know him. I want, to, I want to understand what he thinks, what he likes, how he feels, what he wants me to do. And out of the overflow of my passionate love for these 66 love letters, every sermon I've ever preached just flows out of that. I have a habit that I read until. I'm going to read, and I'm going to read until something jumps off the page. You know, you're reading it's all good. Uh, mm, yeah, mm, oh, uh, yeah. Whoa! And one verse turns yellow and it starts jumping off the page, and your heart starts to palpitate, and it's a promise from God, or, or maybe it's a rebuke. Maybe God's saying, Claudette, you need to repent. You got this sorry attitude. Oh, God. But it's still God talking to me. So when that happens, I write it down. I'm old fashioned. I got notebooks, and I write down that scripture. I like to write it down. I would have been a scribe. We just came from Israel. I would have been a. If they'd had scribettes in those days, I'd have been Claudette the scribette. I love to copy scripture. And so I write it down. I write it down. And then I ask God, I put whatever circumstance, help me to obey this, Lord. I see I've really been messing up lately. You can't read my journals. Now, when I die, they're going to be given to my son. But I don't want y'all reading them because you wouldn't think so good of me anymore. Because I put in there the good and the bad and the ugly. Lord, I love you, but these saints today are driving me out of my mind. Sometimes I put that in my journal. So 
Anyway, I, it's my interaction with God, and it's the scriptures he gives me. Then I go back over it, review it. I have literally thousands of pages. I started this when I was 18, of my interaction with the word of God. you got to love his word, and the more you love it, the more you study it, the more you memorize it, the more faith you will have. Life verses. <clears throat> I started this practice about 23 years ago. I love this. It's just a little tip the Lord gave me. I'm not real smart uh, to be able to memorize hundreds and hundreds of scriptures, although we encourage quizzers to do it. I wasn't smart enough probably to have done it myself, but I knew they could. But I can memorize a few of them. And so I made a habit of getting a life verse for every year. I would ask the Lord to give it to me. What verse this year, Lord, do you want me to memorize and quote every day? That's not just something up here. That something is burned on the fleshly tables of my heart, a way you want me to live. I have 23 of them now. I've been doing this for, okay, wish you gave it to me a long time ago, but he gave it to me 23 years ago. For example, in 1998, we were in a very, very severe trial, a lot of stuff going on in our life, and the verse the Lord gave me was this one. I always take it, I personalize the pronouns, make it a prayer. Lord, today, help me not to fret or to have any anxiety about anything, but in every circumstance, by prayer, with thanksgiving, let me make my request known to you, Lord, and then your peace, that tranquil state of a soul, fearing nothing from God and content with my earthly lot, will set up a garrison or a fort around my heart and around my mind through you, Christ Jesus. I got chills quoting that. I've been quoting that for 18 years. When I do my life verses, I usually do them when I'm soaking in my bathtub. I don't have a jacuzzi. I've got a bathtub, so I soak. I pour some salt in there, and I put some essential oil in there, and I light a candle, and that's usually where I do my life verses. And I quote those life verses, and I say, God, I may not be able to get all of it, but these, when I stand before the throne, I want to have lived. I want this to have been the way I've decided to live my life. There's something about getting some verses that are just yours from God, memorizing them and keeping them and living by them through your life verses. And if you'll ask God, he will give them to you. Number three, <clears throat> interaction with the word. The Lord uh, challenged me once. I was, uh, we were still in Cincinnati. He was associate pastor to Brother Pasley. And uh, the Lord asked me, he said, Claudette, where are the words I've spoken to you? Where are the ramas? I'm like, well, they're, they're all there in notebooks. You know, I keep my notebooks. And when you say something to me, a rhema being a rhema, some people say, I wish I knew which way was right. I need to find out. But anyway, logos is the plan of God, the word of God, the general word of God. The rhema is a word to you. It is your personal word that God's given you. It may have come through your Bible study. It may come to you through the gifts, through prophecy, through tongues and interpretation. Maybe God just spoke it in your spirit about a situation. You heard something in a sermon that was God's word to you. You read it in a book. You saw it on a DVD. You heard it on somebody preaching on YouTube. Maybe a sister. I got a word from the Lord last night through Sister um, Bollinger. When she mentioned shell shock, I'm like, the Lord said, study that. I'm like, yes, that's it. I need that word. Okay? So it may have come through a sister. It doesn't matter. But it's God's word to you. You think, I'll always remember that. No, you won't. If you don't write it down, if you don't categorize it, if you don't keep it. The Lord challenged me by saying, Claudette, if you had a diamond, if someone gave you a beautiful diamond or a beautiful ruby, a beautiful jewel worth a lot of money, where would you put it? I'm like, well, somewhere really, really safe. You know, uh, in case the house burned down, I wouldn't want to lose it. So I'd probably go put it in a, a safe box at the bank or something or, or at least get a vault at home. Right? I'd, I'd keep it really safe, God, because it's worth a lot. Oh, and then I'm getting it. He's saying, aren't my words worth a lot to you? So he was challenging me not only save the words in my thousands of pages here, but get the words about a specific situation, categorize them, date them, say them, out loud and then say amen to them. For example, I wouldn't have the courage to stand up here and talk to you. I don't, I have nothing in myself. I'm just a fellow struggler like you. The only confidence I ever have to stand in front of any audience, where there's one at a home Bible study or several thousand at some conference, is because right here, I've got my first page says, trust the anointing. The first page I have is the call that God gave me when I was 16 to teach his word. The last 30 something pages right there, Every word God has ever given me about my ministry, through a prophet, through an evangelist, through the written word, through whatever. And when Satan says, who are you to get up there and flap your jaws and you don't whatever and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, excuse me. I would like to read this to you. And I go through and I read every word that God has said. I'm opening my mouth and I'm talking the word of God because God asked me to and I'm standing on his promises. And I say amen to everything that God said. 
Okay, now you may not be called to teach or preach, but whatever God has called you to do, you get every word he's ever given you about that, and you say, Satan, I'm here because of the word of God. And you won't know where it is. You'll forget. It'll be scattered all over everywhere if you don't gather it and put it in a safe place. In my prayer room, I have got a bag. I have got uh, everything to do with my son from the time he was in my womb, my miracle baby. I was born with half a womb, half a womb. God, God created so much stuff for that kid to be born. It was just amazing. It was a miracle. And in the womb, God would talk to me some things about this boy. I've got them all written down, and he knows if I die right there what bag to go to. Those are all the things God's ever said about you to mom or to dad or anybody else we know about your life and your ministry. Jonathan, those are treasures. You keep that word of God. Everything God said about the church we pastor. We've been in Troy 13 years. Any saint come up. Sister Walker, I was praying about our church, and I felt like in a little card. Yes, that's the word of God. I'll take it. I'll put it in that bag. Everything God has said about that church is in one bag, and often I'll go to the church and I'll set that big blue bag right there in the front chair when things are going wrong and the devil's a messing and, a, and doing what the devil does. And I'll say, excuse me, I'm here to review the word of the Lord. Everything God has said about this church, I'm choosing to believe it. I'm saying what God said. I'm not saying what I see. I'm saying what God said. And I'm saying, amen. You said this, God, I say amen. You said this, God, I say amen. All God needs is for somebody to agree with him. That's all he needs. God just needs for somebody to say, amen, Lord, which means so be it. So be it. He needs somebody with faith in his word, but he needs us to love his word enough that we keep it. Not only categorize it, maybe it's about your family, whatever you're struggling, if you're having struggle in your marriage, your ministry, whatever that God has given you in your life that's important to you and he's spoken to you about it, write it down, date it, go over it, and say amen. It'll help you on bad days. Get out of that rut of stress, believe you me. I'd like to read. Somebody needs this. Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. The Lord told me this morning to read it. Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. For the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. That's a good one to put at the front of your notebook or whatever about the word of God. That's the power of the spoken word of God, that it will come to pass. When I was a girl, Sister Trammell, just a few others may remember this, but we used to sing out of hymn books. One of my favorite hymns, Sister Bollinger knows back there, was this one. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, oh, by the living word of God I shall prevail. I'm standing on the promises of God. If you know it, sing it with me. I'm standing, Lord, we're standing. We're standing on the promises of God, my son. Savior, standing, Lord, we're standing. We're all standing on the promises of God. Hallelujah. There's nothing more solid you can build your life on. There's nothing more true and more real than you can build your life on. But we've got to love it. We've got to gather it. We've got to review it. We have got to grow in our faith, and we can only grow in our faith as we grow in the Word of God. We've got to deal with our will. You're looking at Sister Walker's body, which is about God forbid. I got on the scale the other day and said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm 30 pounds of chocolate overweight. I lost it six years ago and found it again. God help me. But anyway. I'm going to try to get rid of it, but, but you look at Sister Walker, you describe my body. I've got brown hair, I'm five foot seven, I'm 30 pounds overweight, you know, whatever, my hair's turning uh, gray and used to be dark, and, you know, we describe each other's body. Oh, that's not me. It's just the shell I live in. Uh, the real me is uh, more my uh, soul, which is my mind, how I think, my will, how I decide, my emotions, how I feel. That's Sister Walker's personality. But the most real part of me is still, you haven't got there yet, and that's my spirit. That's what God went, when I was born, breathed into me, a spirit that is like God. And so we have to deal with all these parts of our personality, our essence, if you will. And in dealing with my will, which I told you last night is German and stubborn and strong and opinionated and all kinds of horrible stuff. In dealing with that will, I have to 
find methods that I can to bring my will in subjection to his will. Here's just a few things that Sister Walker uses. Word replacement therapy. I told you last night, those three years that I was bedfast and it had the stroke and was deathly ill, seven specialists tried to fix me. <clears throat> the last specialist that I went to was a um, gynecologist. And I got the bright idea, although I was only 44 at the time, that perhaps one of the things wrong with me is I'd gone in early menopause. I was diagnosing myself. You know, who knows? Maybe I'll go there and I'll think, you know, she'll say, well, for some weird reason, you're like a few years early in menopause and we're going to slap this estrogen patch on you, honey, and it's going to make you Wonder Woman. You're just going to be all fixed and together again. It's going to take away all these horrible symptoms. And I was hoping that was it because that sounds simple. Just stick a patch on estrogen replacement therapy. I had it all figured out. Well, I went, and she was the head of the menopause center for Cincinnati Hospital, and she checked me. She said, oh, I can tell you're terribly ill. You have so many, so many things off in your uh, endocrine system and your brain chemicals and whatever, but it, it's nothing to do with menopause, honey. I'm so sorry. I can't help you. And I was driving down 75 in Cincinnati feeling kind of sad because I thought, finally, something, you know, I'm going to stick that patch on me. And I wanted it to be just estrogen replacement therapy, just a simple fix. And you know, we all want a simple fix, don't we? And I'm crying. Tears are dripping. Because that was the last specialist. I'd been to seven of them. There were no more to go to. And they'd all shook their heads and said, we know you're so sick, but we cannot fix you. And so I'm sad. And God has not fixed me yet. And I'm crying. I'm like, Lord, I thought that was it. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me in my spirit and said, why don't you try word replacement therapy? I'm like, how does that work? <laughs> I talked a little bit about it last night, so I won't go over it, <clears throat> just for those of you who've come in. It's deciding how you'll feel. Instead of feeling how you feel, you decide how you feel. And replace how you feel with the Word of God. And I told you that last night when the saints had called Sister Walker, how do you feel? I feel persuaded that he which hath begun a good, confident that he which hath begun a good work in me is going to perform it till the day of Christ. How do you feel, Sister Walker? I feel Confident, thank you. That he which hath begun a good work in me is, is going to perform it today's Christ. I feel persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, principalities. Honey, I got into that word replacement therapy thing. Here's my uh, list currently I work on. What do you do is you diagnose your own problem. You don't wait on the preacher to preach on it. You say, my God, what's wrong with that preacher? He ain't preached yet on my problem. Well, dig. Get out your shovel. You get in the word and dig. You find out. First of all, you got to figure out your problem. The problem is, and emotionally, are dealing with our will, a lot of times we're believing a lie, okay? Uh, will God guide my life? Here's the first pack. Will God guide my life? You ever been in a thing where you're seeking God's will and he ain't saying nothing, okay? So when you're doing that, the devil's saying, well, he hasn't really got a plan for your life or you're not important or all the junk he says or God's, like I said, deleted you from his contact list or he's not going to answer you. You're just going to have to pick yourself. All that junk the devil says. I write down what he says. Lie right there. My blue card's the lie card. I write down the lie. You are lying to me. This is not the truth. And then I go get out my shovel and I dig in the word and I've got about 18 verses here that's the truth about will God guide my life or not. I got one here that Isaiah 30, 21 says, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, when you turn to the right and when you turn to the left, this is the way. Walk ye in it. I thank you, God, that I am going to, you got you to, you got to get some word out. You got to use word replacement therapy. You got to throw down the lie. When we put on the helmet last night, you got to throw down the lie and find the truth. You need to find it for yourself. And so I write these down. I've got a whole bunch of categories there. Let me put it back together. This little girl on the front says the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And so I say, Lord, let me see things as they really are. Word replacement therapy. It works. Diagnose your own problem. Find the answer in the word. Figure out the devil's lies and quit believing them and say the word. Replace it with how you're feeling. Replace it with the devil's lies. Fasting. Oh, don't we love to talk about fasting. You can tell I ain't been doing it a lot because I've got 30 extra pounds hanging on here. But it really works on the will. It really works on the will. When we went to Cincinnati, there was a lady who died. Um, actually, she was already in the hospital when I got there, so I never met her. She died just a few weeks later. Brother Pasley Sr. preached her funeral, and it was so sad looking at her in the casket. I didn't know her, but they told me she was a great lady, and, and they, they buried her, and I want to be buried like that too if I'm buried, and I'd rather go in the rapture. But anyway, she was in her casket like this. As I said, she really loved the Word of God, and I love that. I don't tell Marvin, let me hold it in the casket and then take it out before... 
you know, they shut the lid and you keep it or give it to my son rather. But anyway, she loved the word of God and she's holding it. And when I saw her, it was a visual that God gave me. She died from some disease. I forgot the name of it, where she literally couldn't eat anymore and she starved to death. Her body would not assimilate food. And they fed her as long as they could through the tube and this, whatever. But eventually it just takes over and her, her body became so rigid. Her, the muscles and everything actually become hardened and the esophagus doesn't work. Nothing works. It's a really weird, strange disease. But anyway, she died of starvation. And when I saw her there in the casket, because to me, the body always represents the flesh, I got a prayer and I looked at her. Her name was Sister Whalen. I said, God, I don't know this lady, but she's ministering to me right now. I want my will to be as weak as her skinny little body. She was a skeleton in that casket. I want my will to be just as weak as her skinny little body is, but I want the power of your word to be strong. And the only way I know for that to happen is to fast, to deny our flesh, to put it under. Fasting weakens your strong, opinionated will. Fasting fortifies your will to do God's will. It stabilizes your weak emotions, and it weakens your strong opinion. If you go after fasting right... That is what it is meant to do. It is meant to weaken the natural man to such an extent that the spirit and the will of God is foremost. The longer you fast, the weaker the, the natural man gets and the stronger the spirit man's become. You ever notice that at the end of a, a two-day, three-day, whatever, seven-day, God anoints you to do fast or Daniel's fast or whatever, many different ways to fast. I can't do total fast like I used to because of my heart problems, so I have to find creative different ways to fast. But whatever you offer to the Lord counts and it matters, and whatever you are giving up is unto him. I'm telling you, at the end of that fast, all that noise in your mind, all your stubborn will, it's just getting weaker and weaker and weaker, and the Holy Ghost in you and your, your human spirit is getting, I want to do God's will. I want to hear what you say. I don't care what you ask me to do. You're just, you're getting stronger and stronger. So fasting is an incredible tool to deal with the stress of having a very strong will and wanting what you want. Um, that was free. I don't know why, but the Lord just told me to show you my little thing here. Um, when I go on a fast, <clears throat> I get out this list here. I was praying one day at church, and we called the church on a several-day fast. And uh, it was a, a time of repentance. We were asking the church to repent. And I was back behind the baptistry praying early one morning, and the Lord said to me, my people want to repent. They don't know what of. A lot of them are, are sinning and really offended me, and they ain't got a clue. Because they didn't murder nobody and they didn't commit adultery last week. And they think they're doing pretty good. Well, God doesn't think so. I've got a list here. Uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I start my a prayer with that. And Hebrews 12, 1, seeing we're compassed about a uh, great of cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Okay? So these are sins which easily beset us. I've got 50 of them listed here. You probably never had me back to speak again. <laughs> Forty of them I've committed at some point in my life. I said, my God, Sister Walker. <laughs> Pride. I'm not going to read it all. If you want to, this is, a, you can't see my copy because I got the ones on there marked I do and I don't do. And I don't want you to see it. It's not your business. That's God's business. But anyway, if, if you'd like a copy, sister, I can get a clean one. You can, whatever. Because the Lord began to take me through his word and show me sins of the spirit that we have all rebelled, clubbered, crumbling, complaining, covetousness, anger, anxiety, worries. You know, worries a sin. My dad believes worries a sin. God said he'd take care of us. If I worry, it's me saying, I don't think you will. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in here. And I tell you, I get that list out. And when I'm on my fast, I'm like, God, I'm, I'm back confessing. I ain't telling the church. I ain't telling you. But I get back on the, the, myself and I, God, forgive me. I, I see. Yeah, I've been doing that. God, please forgive me. Forgive me for speaking negatively to God about that situation. That's a sin. I'm supposed to speak the word of God. I'm sorry, God. You got to repent. You got to be specific. I believe in naming and claiming. Not, my God, you got to give me a Mercedes and a million dollar house. That's stupid, that prosperity gospel. But I believe in naming and claiming my sins. I better name and claim what I'm doing. I'll either judge myself now or I'll be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't want the rapture to take place and me to have junk on my record I haven't got rid of. So I started studying what I do that offends God. And on my fast, I say, God, every day when we do a weekly fast or our, our fast day, I get out this list and I check myself good. And I look in the mirror and I ask God to show me any secret sins that may not be on my list of 50. And that's not conclusive by any means. Praise God. That was free. Okay, In the Bag. I learned this from Nona Freeman. How many of you ever read Sister Freeman's book called In the Bag? 
Boy, this helps get rid of stress so much. She went to teach a ladies' conference, and the Lord gave her this uh, idea to give everybody this little bag, and they were supposed to get a piece of paper and a pencil, and they were supposed to write down all the things that were concerning them, worrying them, stressing them, okay? Write them down. Little things to big things, write them down and put them in the bag. And then when the enemy, and, and pray over them, give them to the Lord, when the enemy would come back and try to get them to worry, you know, and be stressed, <laughs> talking about stress, about whatever they'd put in the bag, they were supposed to say, oh, excuse me, devil, I've already taken that to the throne of God, and God's working on that situation. It's in the bag. Okay, it keeps it in the bag instead of in your mind, driving you nuts, or in your emotions, tearing you up. Because once we've committed it to God, we're supposed to leave it there. We're supposed to cast, I don't want to throw it, then I'll have to go get it. Cast all our care on him, for he cares for us. Me, I cast it, reel it back in. I cast it to him, and he tries to take it and start working on it before he can. Sister Walker's reeling it back in. Oh, my God, what's going to happen? we got to help that saint. Dear God, oh, my Lord, we don't have any money. We can't pay our bills. And I'm just, I'm terrible. It's awful. I have to work at this. We're supposed to strive to enter into the rest, okay? So my effort of striving was I thought, Sister Freeman, thank you. I'm going to do it. Went and got me a bag. We were in overseas ministering. This actually is from Switzerland. I thought, this is cool. So got me a little bag in Switzerland. And it got me just a little three by five card. The first time I did this was in 1996. And I wrote down um, 17 things. Now, not, you know, my toenail hurts, you know. It, it was stuff, you know. It was, it was, you know, stuff that really to be concerned about. And uh, not just in my life, but in people's lives that I cared about and in the church and da-da-da-da. I put down 18. I said 17. I think I put down 18 concerns. Now, she said, don't always be going back in the bag and see if God's working on it. Don't always be looking it up. And, oh, my God, he ain't done nothing yet. She said, just leave it in there. Don't check it really often when Satan comes and makes you worry or be concerned or stressed. Uh-uh. That's in the bag. Thank you, God. And start praising. I thank you, God, you're working on that situation. I thank you, God, you're going to take care of that. And so you're in a posture of praise instead of, uh oh. So, anyway, I'll try it. And I tried it. And actually, I didn't open it for a year. That's pretty good for me, you know, because my nature wants to go in there. Oh, my God, look at number seven. You ain't done nothing. My God, it's getting worse. But anyway, I didn't do that. And it was really a test for me. And so I thought, you know, a year's passed. She said we could look every now and then. It's a whole year. I've got to check my list out. I got it out. Whoa, X. Got it taken care of that. Number two, X. Whoa. I was, I was going crazy. How many of these you think God had taken care of in one year? Huh. 17 of the 18. The 18th one was menopause because I just entered to it very heavily. And I was having hot flashes and I was having mood swings. And, and God was still working on that. He hadn't just totally fixed it because it's a time in life. The only one that was totally done was my menopausal state. All the rest of them. God had answered in some way that was miraculous because I had trusted him to do it. I'd put it in the bag and said, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm not going to stress. I'm going to praise about that. God is working on that. Hallelujah. do it every year it's cool my husband knows about it so I'm going to start to stress again he'll go I thought you put that in the bag <laughs> we got to have somebody to keep us on track here God gave me my husband for that reason hallelujah best man ever walked in shoe leather oh thank you Lord Jesus get you some scriptures over that my favorite one over my bag is Lord, there is no temptation or trial taking me, but such as is common to man. And you will, with every trial, make a way of escape. I will be able to bear this. Your bag's never going to be so heavy. because You don't have to carry it anyway. You're supposed to give it to him. The fourth thing in dealing with your will is to surrender your schedule to God. I learned this from a young minister's wife, actually years ago in Michigan. She was very active. We'd come up to do a youth seminar, and she was very active in her city. She uh, was uh, very talented, led the music at church. Pastor's wife had two little kids, did a lot of civic stuff. She was just a busy, busy girl. And she was telling me one day, she said, I was complaining, actually, to God, saying, oh, Lord, it was near Christmas time. Oh, God, you will not believe. And she was going over her whole list of things she had to do, trying to get God to bless her activities and said, God, I got to do this. I got this musical. I got this. I got this. Oh, God, I'm so tired. And I got this and this and this. Please help me with all this, God. And she said he interrupted her and said, you can go ahead and do all that stuff if you want to. I didn't ask you to do half of it. Sometimes we live in stress because we have a lot of good ideas. 
Whoa, it's a good idea. Oh, I'm going to go do that. I got a good idea. Oh, I'm going to go do that. I got a good idea. I'm going to go do that. Every good idea is not a God idea. He said, come unto me, all you labor that are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. If your burden is too hard and too heavy, and you're just about to go under, you're carrying around something God didn't ask you to carry. Or else the word's a lie. He said, my yoke. Do you give your children, an 8-year-old child, the work of a 16-year-old child and want them to feel all stressed and that they can't do it? No. We, we measure out to them as they're able to do it. A good parent does. God's not going to treat us. He's going to give us what we can do. I didn't always know this. I ended up at the, uh, it was 2006, um, urgent care. Heart, all kinds of issues, not enough oxygen in my blood. They're giving me treatment, considering sending me to the hospital. And I'm stressed because I've got th- three ladies' conferences coming up that I'd promised to do, some of them a year before. And I felt in my spirit when I was lying there just shaking in a violent migraine in the, in the urgent care, the Lord said, you didn't consult me about those three ladies' conferences. Those were the call of the ladies and not my call. Since you didn't ask me, now you're going to have to cancel. So what am I going to do? He said, I want three months. I want you home for three months. You're exhausted. Your spirit is weary from battling in the spirit world, and I need you to rest and drink in. It's not time to pour out. If you'd listened to me, you wouldn't have to call and cancel. Every good idea is not a God idea. If we walk in the Spirit, we can trust the flow of the Spirit. We can trust the flow of what God wants us to do. My, my calling is different than yours, but God will He'll meet it out to us. Not that we're always laying around on lazy boys and drinking orange juice and whatever, and some people fanning us and popping grapes in our mouth. No, that's heaven. That's not here. I hope that's heaven. But anyway, you know, but, but God will not, He won't wear you out. God didn't call you to have a nervous breakdown. God didn't call you because he wants you to live on the edge of burnout. He doesn't want us living in stress. He wants us living in rest. He'll give you a to-do list that at the end of the day can be done. I'm the one who adds 42 things to it that I could never, ever get all that done. So we need to let God direct our schedule. We need to pray about everything. We need to ask God, what do you want me to do? When do you want me to do it? How do you want me to do it? I am mind. We talked about our mind, filling our minds to the Lord God. Talked about different things the Lord uh, challenges me to do to help with my will, to get my will surrendered to his will. Now we're going to talk about our emotions. Our emotions. I was very surprised because I celebrate, and we're going to talk about that a little later, my spiritual birthday every year. And when I was coming up on my 50th spiritual birthday, I'd had the Holy Ghost 49 years. It was December 6, 2005. And I was saying, Lord, next year is my 50th year for you to have lived inside of me. And that was just blowing my mind. If I was the Holy Ghost, oh my goodness, Sister Bowen, I would have been out of here so long ago. I would have stayed about 10 years or 12 or 15 or maybe 20 and said, you know, Claudette is a hopeless case. I am out of here. I'm going to go inhabit somebody else who does better. But for some reason, because he's so good, for 49 years he had lived in this mess that is me and stayed with me and kept working with me and having mercy on me and loving me and teaching me. That blew my mind, Sister Bollinger. It was blowing my mind. So I'm like, my God, next year's 50 years we've been together. That's just so cool. So I ask him, how do you want us to celebrate? I just don't want to celebrate on December the 6th, 2006, 50 years. I want to celebrate every day all year. What do you want me to do? What what are we going to do, God? And I was so shocked. He said, I would like for you to sing to me every day. I'm like, what? Claudie? No. You're talking about my friend Nancy Granquist. You got the wrong number here in your computer. You're talking about my friend Mickey Mangan. They sing. They actually can sing. They sing really good and everybody likes to hear them. Nobody wants to hear Claudette Walker singing. Why do you? He said, no, I want you to sing. I'm like, cool. So I went out and I got me a songbook. 
This was my first songbook. Now, you have to understand, I've never sung a solo in church except the one I just did for you. Uh, but anyway, I, I don't sing. I don't have a singing uh, voice. I wish I did, but he asked me to sing to him. So if the Lord wants to hear me sing raspy and, and bad voice and all, well, I'm going to do it. So I went out and got me a songbook, and it was so cool. Almost every morning when I wake up, Sister Bowen, in my spirit, it was so cool, a song would wake me up. You know, not a new song, but a song. You know, a lot of them from my childhood or whatever. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. And I'd get up and go to my prayer room, and I got me this. It was blank. And so I went in, and I'd write down the day, and then I'd write down the whole song. Then I'd write down my thoughts about the song and whatever's happening that day. And I started doing this. That was eight years ago. I've got over 800 songs and five song books. A hundred of them are new. Because it did say, sing unto the Lord a new song. So when he asked me to do that part, I'm like, we're really challenged here, God, because I'm not a singer and I'm not a songwriter, so I need some help. He said, just go with some things you know. I'm like, okay, cool. I was in this real stressful situation, and so I went with the song. You will recognize it right away. And I just changed the words around a bit. I apologize to the man in Austria who was in a grave. I went and visited his grave that wrote the song. Silent night. I would sing this to myself every night before I went to sleep. Because I needed to. Silent night. Holy night. I am calm. For my faith is bright. You're my shepherd. And I'm your sheep. Lord, I'll rest in faith. For your word you will keep. Tonight I'm going to sleep in heavenly peace. Tonight I'll sleep in heavenly peace. Oh, man, that just ministered to me. I just loved that little song. Now, I told you the Lord asked me to write him some new ones, and I was challenged. So... One morning, I'm just new at this. I've only been doing it a few weeks. I went down to my prayer room, not because I'm so spiritual, because I'm an insomniac, but it was still dark. The sun had not yet come up. And so I went downstairs, and I'm going to pray. And he asked me to sing first thing every morning. And this morning, I'm so tired. I've only slept a few hours. He's wanting me to sing. And I'm leaning over the hot sick. I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. honey, I can't think of amazing grace. But all of a sudden, this little melody came out, and I began to hum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I said, oh, Lord, I think I just hummed to you. I'm a little teapot. He said, you did. Just go with it. I said, okay, we'll work on it. Mm -hmm. Here is my heart, Lord. I open the door. Lord Jesus, I've never needed you more. Just look into my closet and open every drawer. Throw away all the clutter, Lord, and clean up the floor. I loose all the fear, Lord. I loose all the pain. I loose every trace of pride in Jesus' name. I loose negative talk. I loose depression's face because you died so all my sins could be erased. Now bind me to your truth, Lord, and bind me to your grace. Fill me with your love, Lord. Let me see your blessed face. Please fill me with your spirit, Lord. I loose every doubt. And it's early in the morning, and I'm tired, and I'm running out of inspiration. I loose every doubt. So just tip me over and pour me out. <laughs> Hallelujah! God loves for us to sing to him. I didn't know that until eight years ago. I thought he only wanted to hear the people sing who could sing. He actually likes to hear me sing, and I still can't sing. After all my 800 songs, I think he'd give me a better voice, but he didn't. I actually have written about 10 actually brand new songs, which is a miracle. We're talking melody and words. I'm going to sing one to you. The Lord told me to make a fool out of myself for Christ because somebody needs it. <clears throat> Sister Freeman wrote a book, a biography on her husband's life called Everything's Going to Be All Right. That's what he always told Sister Freeman. No matter what was happening in Africa, and she'd get all stressed, he'd say, honey, everything's going to be all right. So I read that book, and I thought, you know, in tribute to her, Lord, I would love to write a little song. She was dying. And I wrote this little song about uh, three weeks before she died. I was blessed to call her. And Marv and I, he, he actually can sing pretty. We sang it to her, and she was just so delighted. Anyway, it goes like this. Everything's gonna be all right. So, Lord, I'll praise you through the darkest night. 
For Lord, you sent your word, and in my spirit I heard that everything's going to be all right. If you've been bound by the enemy, he's telling you that you'll never be free. You just say, Satan, you're a liar. My heart is full of God's own power, and by faith I say I have the victory. Sing it with me. And everything's going to be all right. So, Lord, I'll praise you through this darkest night for Lord you sent your word and in my spirit I heard that everything 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 everything's gonna be all right give him praise because it is everything everything he's got everything under control God is large God is in charge we can rest in our spirits in the middle of the storm because God wants us to live in a place of peace, in a place of rest, in the middle of the spirit of Antichrist that's working in this world. Honey, I got so into this, my family does not appreciate my talent or the lack thereof. We went to Hawaii, and my son and daughter-in-law had fallen in China. We were doing some work in the underground church. I'd fallen in China and had to have uh, knee surgery, and I had a hip out of place, and so I'm, I'm in a wheelchair in Hawaii. Isn't that a great thing? But anyway, I decided I wanted to go anyway, so I'm in a wheelchair. They're all doing Hawaii, and I'm sitting on the lanai, which is what they call their little deck, in my wheelchair. And so early one morning, I'm outside. I'm so into this. Honey, I collect. This is my noisemaker from China. This morning, I went around. I hope I didn't wake anybody up at the Hampton Inn, but anyway, this is my aha musical instrument. And there's scriptures that say, aha, Satan wants to say, aha, I have swallowed her up, aha. You read it in scripture, he's like mocking kind of thing. So this is my aha back to the devil. And I just walked around my motel room early this morning going, aha, aha, you're not going to do it in Jesus' name. Aha, that what you intended to do me, God is going to do. And I started singing some victory songs, and this is my aha. So they don't appreciate all my noisemakers. I have maracas from Mexico. I have things I bought in Russia. I have got an entire bag. I have got 12 rhythm band instruments. One night at prayer meeting, I passed them out, and I made everybody play something that was there. And we just went around the church making noise for the Lord. And so, anyway, I'm really, really into that. Um, there was another thing I was going to say. No, I forgot what it was. I'd blame it on menopause, but I'm past that. Uh, I don't know. must not have been important. Okay, anyway. So, anyway, so I learned that uh, I need to sing at home. I need to sing and lift my voice. And it helps to add a little dance there, too. I like to dance at church, but <clears throat> found out it's a good thing to dance at home. David said, I will dance. He made a decision. He decided to pick up his feet and move them. And so I would get some of my faster songs, and I have a habit now of going around my house dancing before the Lord. I was teaching a ladies' retreat in Illinois, and Dr. Blash, who is a UPC pastor, he's a psychologist, uh, he has a, a church in St. Louis. He's an incredible man, so smart and so gifted. He, he told this about the brain, who studies the brain. Duh, that's what he does. But anyway, he said that they hooked up some uh, uh, spirit-filled people to these electrode thingies where they measure your brain stuff, and they asked them, they put them in separate rooms, so it wasn't for a show, to enter into worship, to begin to sing, to begin to talk in tongues in particular, to begin to just worship the Lord, just enter into a spirit of worship. They asked them to do that, and they did. When they got done and checked the effects on their brain, he said that they found out that worship verbally, singing, movement, praising, doing what we do at church and hopefully at home, has three times the calming effect on the brain as a dose of morphine. God don't ask us to praise him because he's an egomaniac. Come praise me. God always, he, he, he loves our praise. He wants our praise. But because he loves us so much, it's beneficial even to us. And we need to understand and realize that if we will obey the Lord and sing in the middle of the storm, it actually has an effect on our brain. It helps us enter into that rest he wants us to live in. We're still talking about the emotions. My third um, attempt there to exert myself and enter into rest, and I mentioned this last night, but I brought it today, is my Thanksgiving journal. 
I designed this. I'm thinking about maybe marketing it. I think it'd be cool. But anyway, uh, it's got a cool picture of there. Somebody praising on the front. The scripture says front and back and everything. Give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This one I've been working on just the last two years. And I've got about probably 1,400 things in there I've written down I'm thankful for in the last two years. I divided it up. And uh, here's the categories in case you just might want to do some. You can do your own. But anyway, I've got one category about the wonders of creation, people who have blessed me, answers to prayer, today's blessings, both big and small, the character qualities of the Lord, spiritual lessons the Lord has taught me, promises I love in his word, my trials, past and present. Give thanks in everything. Give thanks for everything. You may choke, but if you're in some trial that's driving you crazy, thank God for it. It'll take some of the pressure off. I thank you. You're allowing blah, 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 in all things. My physical blessings and my good health. The first time I started this journal, the Lord challenged me. Uh, that was the first category he gave me. He asked me to thank him for my good health, and I just had a stroke. I said, what? I've been bed fast for two years, and you, you want me, Claudie, to praise you for my good health? I'm on the verge of going to heaven here any day, and seven doctors can't fix me. You want me to praise you for my good health? I would. I was like, what? Because when you're that sick, I mean, I couldn't think of nothing much. But I'm like, okay, number one. So I had to start with things that other people had I didn't have. So I'm like, hmm, I've got a bunch of stuff, but let me see. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, Sister Emmert, she's got cirrhosis of the liver. You know what? Praise you for my good liver. Now, nobody ever told me it didn't work, so I assume it does. So I thank you, God, that I got a good liver. <laughs> Hallelujah. I saw a man in my church in a wheelchair. I'm not in a wheelchair. Honey, by the time I started writing my list, I had over 300 things in a year that I was thankful for about good health when I was still sick as a dog. I don't care what's going on in your life. You can find something to praise about. There's still somebody else. And then I would thank God for some disease I didn't have. And I'd write a list and pray for all the people who had it. You've got to fight back. You have got to fight to live in rest if you are stressed and the best way to do that is to live with gratitude and to live with thanksgiving i told you last night this is my testimony book and on bad days when satan's you know what he does anyway i'll go in my bedroom i'll open this up and i would just like to have a testimony service we don't testify anymore but i still do at home and i open it up and i'm here to testify that on i'll just do a few for you It'd be cool Ta -da, ta -da. people oh that's a cool thing the people i love to do that i thank you god for all the people in my life that's my good health. Let me see which one. Oh, this is a cool one. you got to do this one. Lord, I thank you for all of your character qualities. Because when things are not going right in your life, and God is not yet answered, Satan's always trying to accuse God that he's not coming through, da da da, da always painting God to be some way that he's not. And so I did this study, or I am doing this study right now, of all the wonderful character qualities of God. I'm up to 110 things. Whoo! I thank you, God, for your unconditional love. I thank you for your compassion. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your long-suffering. I thank you for your omnipotence. I thank you for your sovereignty. We'd be here all a long time if I did all 110. You get done magnifying God and looking at him for how he is and seeing how he is and making God bigger. Your problems start shrinking. They start shrinking. They start shrinking. You begin to look and you begin to magnify and you begin to praise and you begin to thank God. And you say it out loud for the prayers you've answered. That's so cool. If he answers the tiniest little prayer, write it down. I write down sales that God blesses me with, and I get things cheap. And, and one day I went, I, oh, this is cool. I'll tell you this. I just love that. God cares about everything. Isn't that cool? He cares about everything. We did a, a marriage retreat for the Stockton Church, Brother and Sister Haney, on Valentine's. And then my husband and I, we had a, a few days, you know, that, I don't know what they call it, like RCI stuff or whatever, where you have, you know, stuff's already paid for and you can stay in a motel. He does all of our business stuff, as you can tell. Thank God. But anyway, we had a couple days already paid for that we could stay in San Francisco. So that was cool. And my husband ends up with this horrible stomach virus. That was not cool. So he's like, Bleh. he's so sick. And I'm like, honey, do you mind? You know, I've already got your medicine. And if I just sit here and watch you puke, that's not going to help anybody. So do you mind if I just, you know, go walk up and down the street and see a little of this city? He goes, no, go on, honey. Bleh. I'm like, bye. bye. So anyway, great Valentine's. But anyway, uh, we went out. And I, I'm just, I'm just going to go up and look at the square and look at a few. I didn't want to buy anything really. I just can't, you know, afford much. I was broke. And so I'm just walking around looking and, and the Lord's like, uh, I saw a thing called some kind of designer connection resale shop. He goes, go over there. And I'm like, I don't want anything. I don't need anything. I just wanted to go look up at the square and the flowers. I really wanted to sit outside because it was snowing in Michigan. And I was enjoying California weather and I didn't want to shop. He's like, go over there. And I'm like, okay. So I walk in. I'm just looking around because he told me to go. I'm like looking around. And, and some of the tops, even the uh, sale ones, because this is a very fancy part of San Francisco. We're like 100 bucks and I'm on sale. I mean, resale. Well, that's dumb. And so all of a sudden, the lady, I tried a pair of shoes. And 
the lady's like, what size do you wear? And I'm like, nine narrow, why? She said, come here. She said, a friend just brought these in, and she wants me to get rid of them for her. I said, she's really rich, and the shoes are all very expensive. She said, do you need any shoes? I'm like, well, actually, my black flats have got a hole in the bottom. And I'm going to have to have them resold. Yeah, I need some black flats. She goes, let me take your She goes, here, Cole Hahn. Leather shoes, about $150 shoes. I forget exactly what I paid for them. Cheap as I'll get out. And then she goes, do you, do you need any red boots? I'm like, oh, no. Why not? Red's my favorite color. My Volkswagen's red. What do they cost? $36. I said, how much would they have been originally? She said, oh, these are $250 boots. And they looked brand new. Honey, I put them fancy leather from Italy. Put them fancy leather boots on. I'm a walking around San Francisco just a styling in my $36 boots. I'm like, thank you, God. Hallelujah. That old song in the 70s, these boots are made for walking, and that's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to walk all over you. They're my devil boots. Every time the devil gets me, I put my red boots on, and I say, God, you're going to bruise Satan under my red boots shortly. You're going to bruise Satan under my feet shortly. <laughs> Hallelujah. That was fun. Got my red boots in the book. But anyway, get your Thanksgiving book going. It's cool, and it's a neat thing to leave your kids. Whew. If you go to heaven before the rapture. Hallelujah. Can Nana just give God some praise? The last thing I wrote in my book that I'm most grateful for this year, I have the one miracle son. He's been married for eight years, and God blessed him with a beautiful baby girl 18 months ago. We were so thankful because she's so healthy. Oh, my goodness. The kid never had a cold. She's just, she'd never had a fever, never been sick, and beautiful and smart and sweet and precious and she has to go to daycare because my husband, um, her daddy works uh, youth pastor for Doug Davis in Long Island, New York. Her mama works full time at a college. So she goes to daycare about 20 hours a week and Jonathan takes her and, and picks her up. So he went to pick her up one day from daycare. This was June 26th to be exact this year. Pick her up from daycare and uh, uh, the lady gives a report. She only keeps six children in her home. She's a retired school teacher. She gave Jonathan reports. Said, oh, Q's been so happy all day. She's walking around singing and laughing and playing and running. She's good. She ate well, blah, blah, report, good. 3.30, he picks her up with this good report from daycare, puts her in the back seat. Normally, when he gets home, he takes her, because it's a Thursday. This was the Thursday when he had to teach that night youth class. She has a little jumpy thing. I don't know what you call them, all these fancy things you know, where you jump. has little toys all around it. She likes to do that, and once a day, he'll let her watch a little video, a little Disney video or a Bible video or something for about 20 minutes. He normally puts that in, gives her some snacks so she can just calm down and chill. And since so she's all happy and contained, he said, often I will go down the hall to my study or whatever and just begin to work. 20 minutes later, he knows for 20 minutes she's going to be happy. She can't go anywhere. She's in there, and she's eating, and she's happy. He said, I do that every day. It's our routine. So when I got home that day, he said, I don't know why. I tell you, the steps of a good man, the steps of a good woman are ordered by the Lord. He said, Mom, I didn't take her upstairs. I just, I sat down and began to study downstairs, and she began to play a little around me. And he said, I looked at her, and I thought, boy, she looks tired. Maybe she had a, you know, really. And he said, pretty soon, she's a very active kid. It's about 18 months old and doesn't want to be held a lot. And she crawled up on his lap and laid her head on his chest. She already had her nap. She laid her head on his chest. And he thought, what? This is weird. He just hugged her. I love you, baby. And so he's holding her like this and studying his Bible when she begins to have a violent seizure. She stops breathing. My son's never been trained in any of this. He screamed. He took her. He laid her on the island and the thing and, and saw and he said, already, Mom, she was starting to turn blue. She was rigid. She was not breathing. And he said, I'm screaming, Jesus, Jesus, and didn't know where his phone was. Had laid his phone down, couldn't remember where he put it. He said, I just began, he'd never been trained, but he began to try to blow in her mouth. Jesus, blow. Jesus, blow. Hit her little chest. Jesus, blow. She's still not breathing. He gets 911, please come, my baby's dying. And within six minutes, they're there. But for that six minutes, he had to keep her alive with his own breath. When the EMT got there, they put her on the oxygen. They got her and revived where she was starting to breathe a little more on her own and was actually alive. And the man told him, said, Jonathan, if you had not done that, this baby would have been gone time we got here. She would not have lived. And then it hit him. If I had put her in that jumpy, she would have died in that room alone. He would have come back 20 minutes later and his baby girl gone. 
Talk about a praise and a thanksgiving. God spared my baby's life, and I thank him. She has some sign of severe seizures that, that are triggered by fever. Evidently, she had a degree fever from teething. They didn't know it. 2% of babies can spike. My brother's a doctor told me from 99 degrees to 104 to 105 within five minutes, and that's what happened to her. And when she hit the highest of the fevers, when she started to seize, she also has the complication that she not only has these type of seizures, but immediately she stops breathing. But God spared her life. Yeah. He let us keep our baby. And I am so thankful to God. I just want to give him praise today for sparing Quincy's life, for leading my son, for giving him the knowledge of what to do. I thank God with all of my heart. God is so good. God is so good. And our spirit, I told you the most real part of us, and I really believe with all my heart that you can, uh, like this morning, I got up early and I like to listen to nice, soft music, and I put on uh, a cellist playing How Great Thou Art, and it just ministers to me. And I, I can do things to calm my mind. I can do things to clutter. You can. I like to go out and stare at nature. You know, not that I'm necessarily praying, Sister Bollinger, just I like to look at leaves. I like to hear water. I like to, I can get my mind, you know, I can, I can do that. There are things I can do. I, I can... I can get my will, I can, but whatever, I, I can get my emotions in, in a certain place. And, but the truth is, I believe the real rest, Hebrews 3.11 to 4.11 is talking about, has to come and radiate from that deepest, most real part of me, which is my spirit. We do all these other things I've talked about, and like I said, I'd like to hear all the things you do to live in rest instead of stress. I've just shared a few things God's given me along the way. But in our spirit is where that rests. Paul said, I pray that your whole spirit, most important part of me, and soul, and body, be preserved blameless into the coming of the Lord. My spirit needs to be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord. Jude says, build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Romans 8 says, we know not what we should pray for us, God, but the Spirit prays through us. Did you know you not only pray in tongues? We're talking about praying in tongues here, which you need to do, and we need to do it often. It ministers to that Spirit. It prays things. It prays mysteries. We don't know what it's praying, but it is entering it into place and putting rest inside of our spirits when we're so stressed. But not only we know about praying in tongues. I don't have to go there because you're spiritual women. That's why you're here. But did you know Romans also talks about groanings, which cannot be uttered? Sometimes Sister Walker can't even pray in tongues, but the whole world is pressing on me and I'll just go fall on my face in my prayer room and go oh, 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 oh. you take me at a psychologist and I do that they put the white jacket put me in the crazy place and give me pills but God doesn't do that he goes ah angel did you hear Claudette groaning I know what she's saying she don't even know what she said but let me tell you what she said let me tell you what she's concerned about Sometimes I can't even groan. Sometimes I just cry. Just go sit there. <laughs> and tears just flow for 15 minutes. Did you know that counts when you're doing it as unto God? Tears are a language that God understands. Every tear he catches in his bottle. Every tear he writes down in his book. He writes when you cried it, why you cried it, and how he can do to make you stop crying. And when we're doing these things, we're groaning, we're crying, we're praying in tongues, we're doing these things that our spirit is praying to God. Mysteries are going on in the heavenlies that we don't even know. We may never have an understanding. But God, in that secret time of our spirits ministering to God and God's spirit ministering to us, you sing in tongues, you pray in tongues. Let me tell you this. I learned this last year. I volunteer at Urshan College five to six weeks a year, depending on my schedule. The Bible says, let the older women teach the younger women. I tell them when I get there, my qualification to be here is that I'm old. You're young, I'm old. That's why I'm here. And for a week, I just hang out at the school. I usually preach in chapel, but I just hang out and say, I'm here. Let's talk. Let me listen to you. And, and basically, I'm just affirming what they're doing. Yeah, God's with you. God's hands on you, honey. I love you. I believe in you and pray for them if they have boyfriend trouble or whatever. I'm just there hanging out because God called me to do it. It's called open hearts. And in the first open hearts meeting this um, January, 
It's about 50 girls. We're all sitting around the lounge about 10 o'clock at night because they work and go to school, so we have to meet late at night. They're all sitting around in their jammies or whatever. And, and so I'm saying, because uh, some new kids there, and I'm like, uh, tell me who you are and what are your dreams and what do you want to do for God? And you know, I want to build a church and I want to start an orphanage and I want to be a missionary and I'm going to be a writer and I'm going to, you know, all these dreams these girls have. I'm like, yeah, go girl. And they tell us about what they feel from God. And, and this one girl, she goes, uh, I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's what God's put on my heart. And I, I want to be a music therapist. I'm like, huh? Say what? What's that? She explained it to me. Maybe you know, but I thought this was so cool. Remember the U.S. Uh, representative? I can see her face. Can't think of her name. That got shot in the parking lot. She was making a speech. Okay. Okay. The, the bullet went in a part of her brain that, that controls speech. So she couldn't talk anymore. A music therapist, they called in. And this is what I didn't know. The part of your brain where you speak is totally different than part of the brain where you sing. The part of the brain where she sang was not injured. So the music therapist began to teach her to sing answers. Now, it took a while because her brain was severely damaged. But she would, and if you'll notice, when she makes speeches, she's getting better. But it's kind of singy, songy, monotony, whatever. And they took the songy part out of it. So she trying to teach her to speak in a monotone-like thing. I was like... Wow, that is so cool, God. You ask us to sing. Remember in, in Psalms it says, we can't sing in this strange land. We can't sing here. We're captives. No, it was the prophets. It wasn't in the Psalms anymore, the prophets. We, I think it was Ezekiel. We can't sing in this strange land. The psalmist wrote about it too. We go, God says, yeah, you can. When you can't verbalize how bad everything is to God. When you can't come up with words to say, switch over to the other part of the brain and just start singing. It'll begin to minister. It'll begin to illuminate. It'll begin to free. It'll begin to access. And I promise you that other part of your brain will kick in eventually. And you can, it, God will put some words in there you can say. But if you can't think of a thing to say, you can always still sing. I love to go celebrate my spiritual birthday. This is free, and I think I skipped this part. I don't know where it is, so I'll just say it. it may not fit anywhere, but anyway. We're talking about the spirit. <clears throat> uh, most of us as young girls make a list of, you know, Prince Wright, Mr. Charming, you know, guy riding on the white horse. I want him to be tall, have dark hair. I want him to be smart. I want him to have money. I want him to, you know. You got a list of the rest of it. Anyway, we make this list of this ideal guy and hope we can, you know, he'll find us or we'll find him or God will hook us up or something. We dream. It's okay. Did you know God's a dreamer? He's dreaming about his bride. And he's got a particular type of bride he wants to marry. Do a study in the word of the kind of spirit that is pleasing to God. Okay? A meek and a quiet spirit. It's very pleasing in the sight of God. I did a study once. I came up with 17 things in the Word of God. There may be more, but I found 17 types of spirit. A joyful spirit, a quiet spirit. I don't have time to do them all. But that's God's dream list. He wants to marry a bride, not that looks a certain way physically or whatever, but he wants her to have a spirit that are these certain ways. So that's another study there that you can just do. I want to have a spirit that's pleasing to the Lord. I want him to say, wow, I can't wait to marry Claudette Walker. I can't wait till she's my bride because I love her spirit. And frankly, if we get our spirit, according to all the dictates of Scripture, the way God wants it to be, and we have to work on it. It's an everyday challenge. We all have to work on it. But most of the qualities have to do with his Holy Spirit. So it's a marriage of his Holy Spirit to my human spirit till we become so alike. They say when people are married a long time, they get sort of alike, you know. Sort of act like, think alike you ought to after I've been married to Marvin 40 years. We redid our vows overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. It was so cool. I told him I'd take him on for 40 more. But after that, I wasn't sure because I'd be 103 and I'd be so old, especially if he was still preaching and pastoring by then. I'm just not sure I could do it. Oh, I'm teasing. But anyway, we, we got remarried overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. But we need to, to work on our spirit and we need to become like the Lord in our spirit. Because the truth is, the essence of who we really are is our spirit. Think about people you really like to be around, people that you admire in God for some reason or another. Don't you just like to hang around them? I used to just love to sit anywhere near 
Sister Nona Freeman. If I could just sit by her, I just hoped a little God would slosh over on me, you know. But the people that you love and admire, they have beautiful spirits. Their spirits have been trained. And when you meet them, you're not even so impressed by their personality, about how they think or how they feel or how their emotions or whatever. What impresses you the most is their powerful, dynamic human spirit who's been trained by God in the ways of God to when you're around them, you feel like you're around Jesus. That's my goal. And that's the kind of bride that God wants to marry. For 18 years, I've been doing this. This is one of my last things, and we're going to close. You've been so patient to listen to me rattle on. Um, on December the 6th, 1996, I'd had the Holy Ghost 40 years. And for the first time, this came to me that we celebrate our natural birthdays, which we should. It's a big deal. And God wants us to, I'm sure, you know, enjoy that celebration of natural life. But I thought, God, I, I always thank him on December the 6th for the Holy Ghost and, you know, X amount of years. And I would thank him. But I never made a really big deal out of it. I never celebrated. So I decided when I had the Holy Ghost 40 years, and um, that's 18 years ago, that I was going to save some of my money that I had earned. I will not offer to the Lord that which cost me nothing. Didn't ask my husband for the money. It was something I had earned and worked for. And I'd go get me a motel. And my husband knows where I am. And um, he knows that if he needs me, he can call the, I didn't have a cell phone back in those days, but he can call the motel because he knows where I am in case of emergency. I don't even tell the church people where I am, where I'm going. Nobody on earth even knows where I am except Marvin for those 24 hours. And I celebrate my spiritual birthday. I take my journal from the last year of my study of the Word of God that's been dated. I take all my noisemakers. I take my songbook. I take um, his word. I take uh, uh, my devotional book I may be studying on, anything that's relevant to that year, maybe any little thing somebody's given me that ministers to me. Um, I got a couple little doves recently, and I'll probably take them this year. Just whatever. I just fill my whole suitcase full, all kinds of stuff. I used to get a room with two double beds, and I'll just set all my stuff over there on the deal. And for 24 hours, I do sleep five or six of the hours. But for the time I'm there that I'm not sleeping, I am reviewing my growth in God. You know how you, your kid, you put them up against the wall? Larissa, mom, right? Next year, whoa, you grew two inches, Larissa. Look at you, you're growing. The devil will tell you you're going nowhere and doing nothing. He'll tell you you're just playing it out, you're just whatever. But if you got your growth journal and you've got your things you're learning, you can go over and say, man, last January the 6th, I was reading the Word, and God showed me this, and I never knew that before, and now I know it. Devil, look, I just grew a little bit. And then I was learning, and God, whoa, man, I've had a good year. I've learned some things. God's been with me. I've been growing in God. And you celebrate your spiritual growth. The first time I went, away. I really thought, because it's such a big deal. I, I, this is going to be so cool. I actually stayed two days the first time. And I thought, because I had 20 years of notebooks to review. So I thought, wow, this is going to be so cool. You know, maybe God will send an angel I can see with my eyeballs. I did. I thought, that'll be so cool. You know? So I went in the room, and I'm just, it's just a plain old motel room. And I'm like, oh, well. I thought, I'll check the shower. <laughs> no angel. But anyway, I'm like, well, whatever. It's going to be good. And, and it was good, but God didn't say anything to me. You know, I didn't hear his voice. And I'm just reviewing, and I'm singing, and get tired, you know, the mind can only absorb what the seat can endure. And so I'd get up out of my little recliner and go outside and walk up and down the parking lot and sing a while and come back and review and praise and be quiet and just what we do to be with God. Just spend the whole time with him, celebrating. And near the end, I was packing up all my stuff to leave the last morning and I thought, boy, I really wish it had been nice if God would have just said something to me, you know, but that's okay, God. You've said a lot of stuff. I, I appreciate it. And I'm praying, I'm praising, I'm thanking him for the Holy Ghost for living in me for 40 years. And all of a sudden I heard his voice, and I had 20 years worth of notebooks stacked on the bed. And he said, uh, Claudette, what do you see when you look at those notebooks? You know what I said, Sister Bowen? I'm like, uh, melancholy nature. I'm like, well, I see a continuum, Lord, that looks kind of like this. Sometimes I'm doing really good. Other times I ain't doing so well. Sometimes I'm really... That's what it looks like to me, God. And I, and I see... Bible studies I might could have taught. Sometimes I didn't think the best things about people or maybe said something that wasn't the most kind. Or I see, I was listing my failures. So would you like to know what we see up here in heaven when we look at your notebooks and your journey of your spiritual growth? I'm like, that'd be cool. And in the spirit, I saw him take his hand. And he had a giant eraser, and my continuum went like that. And I saw him take an eraser and erase the entire bottom part of the continuum. And all that was left were the mountain peaks. He said, you want to know what we see in heaven when we look at your life? I'm like, yeah. He said, we see every Bible study you have taught. 
We see every prayer that you have prayed. We see every kind word you've ever given any saint. We see every kind act you've ever done for anybody. He said up here in heaven, when you repent of all that stuff on the bottom, we wipe it off. And all we have on the top are the victories. I see you as a victorious, overcoming Christian, Claudette. Happy birthday. And I'm like, wow, what a birthday gift. I saw myself through God's eyes. Did you know God does not see your failures? He does not see your struggles. If you have repented, heaven has wiped it off. And all God has recorded in heaven are your victories. And Satan will tell you you're a loser and you ought to quit and you ought to give up on yourself because you're not living up to the own standard you set for yourself. That's a bunch of bunk and it's a lie from hell. You say, no, God has recorded in heaven all of my victories and all the bad stuff is wiped away by the blood. I am a victorious Christian. I'm growing in the Lord. I'm pressing toward the prize for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not what I want to be, but I ain't what I used to be. And I'm on my way. Satan, you got to fight back and you've got to ask God to show you yourself as he sees you. Because the devil will always either make you out to be more, the chair of P-R-I-D-E, and make you think you're worth more than you are, or he'll be telling you you ain't worth nothing. One of the two, that's the devil's take, where God's is forgiveness and God sees victories. Living in stress or living in rest. I just feel to read that first scripture again. Lord, help me to be zealous. See how hard Sister Walker has to try to get there? Help me to be zealous and exert myself and strive diligently to enter into your rest and to know and experience it for myself. It was January 2012, and we were expecting, oh, wow, it's going to be a great year. And all hell broke loose the second week of January. And I'm praying. I'm trying to seek God. And much of my prayers are in stress. Oh, God, help. What in the world are we going to do? Are you up there? <laughs> and I'm not telling you this because I see things in the spirit all the time because I don't, but I did see this. I was praying and I, I saw myself on a boat. And this boat was an old wooden boat. It was an old wooden boat. And I was holding on to the side, and there was this violent storm, and water was just sloshing over that, the edge of the boat. And I have a bucket. I'm holding on with this hand. And I've got a bucket. And I'm bailing water with one little bucket, throwing it over the side, going, Help! Help! Somebody, help! And there's nobody on the boat to help. And it's going under, and I can't swim in the natural. So this was a horrifying thing for me to see because I can't swim. When Marvin wants me in a crowd, he'll go, psst. And I'll catch his eye. And he'll either say, let's go. <laughs> or every now and then he'll say, love you. It's a signal. And so as this water and this noise and this storm, it's like, it's this violent storm. I'm going, help! And I'm screaming and I'm throwing water. I heard and all that noise, psst. Marvin, thank God, where have you been? My God, this boat's going down. Where are you? And then I, I left my boat, and I looked down, and in the bow of the ship was an over um, awning-like thing protecting the Lord from the, the weather, and there was a, a wooden bench and a pillow, and he was lying on his side on this pillow in the middle of the storm. And it's still like, but he's just lying there. He's looking at me. He said, Claudette, you can stay up there if you want to and keep screaming and trying to bail water and trying to stand up. Or you can come down here by me and lay down, put your head on my shoulder, and be quiet until I decide to work. Bye, Bucket. <laughs> I get down there and I crawl up beside him and lay. And he spoke to me and said, get up when I get up. There is rest in the middle of a violent storm.
can you stop the storm? Can you fix the storm anyway? Uh Uh-uh. Unless there's something directive that God gives you. He is the master of the storm, and he decides when to stand up and say, peace be still. So why should I stand there and keep uh, just about to drown and keep my bucket and keep screaming help when it ain't doing a lick of good anyway when God in my spirit is saying, Claudette, come and just rest. I heard Barb Willoughby preached not long before she died. She had cancer when she preached it about the calm in the middle of the storm. We've all heard that in the middle of the tornado. There's an eye where it's absolutely calm right in the middle. Every now and then people get caught up in that calm and live through a violent tornado. She didn't exactly explain how to get there. So after I listened to her CD, I thought, God, I heard her and she's got cancer and I'm, I'm amazed that she's still preaching. As sick as she is and she's obviously found some place in you I haven't found yet. How do I get to that calm? I believe there's a calm in the middle of every storm. How do I get there? And I just begin to study, and I have an acronym for calm, C-A-L-M. Come and love me, C-A-L-M. The calm in the middle of your storm. The place where you can go from that place of violent stress. And it all comes against us. We're never going to the place, I believe, where we live totally stress-free. That's why the Bible said to strive and diligently work there. We can get better and better at it. (coughs) But he told me, the calm in the middle of the storm is when you decide. Quit listening to the voices of the failure of your past. That'll drive you nuts. I should have done this. I ought to have done that. It's too late. Yesterday's gone. Quit listening to the distressing voices beside you of all the demands and the things that you can't fix anyway. Now, if your hair's dirty, go wash it. If your kids need spanking, spank your kid. I'm not saying there's nothing we have to do, but things we can't fix, okay? Uh, All these distressing circumstances around us. Quit looking there. The Lord said, quit looking ahead to an unknown future. It's scary out there. Dear God, don't look there. You'll go crazy. You'll be stressed to the max. Look up to the cross. Look up to the finished work. Look up to the throne. And come and dwell with me in the heavenlies where God lives in a place of absolute perfect peace. Did you know God never bites his fingernails? God has never said, oh, no, what am I going to do? Not in his vocab. God's at perfect peace. He knows what he's going to do about every situation. And when he left this earth, he said, my peace, this blows my mind, I give you. Not as the world giveth unto you, but my peace. Now that lets me know that if I keep striving and I keep being diligent, I keep doing everything I know to do, I can get to the place where I can live in my spirit in that same place of calm undisturbedness that God lives in. Where are you going to find it, Sister Walker? It's in here. The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's just that a lot of times I access my German nature instead of my Holy Ghost nature. And I'll get into that trying to fix it, try to make a list. Oh my God, we got to do this, we got to do this, we got to do blah, blah, blah. Or I'll access my worry brain instead of the peace. But the peace is in there. And so I say, Lord, I access that peace. I release the peace that does live inside of me because I'm full of the Holy Ghost into this situation. Everything around me may be getting worse, but we can live. He wants us to in our spirit, in that place of calm, undisturbedness. Absolute faith that God is going to keep his word. Peace, knowing he's going to take care of me and everybody around me. Voice is gone, but my husband wrote a song, and I just this morning felt in prayer it would minister to somebody here. So just close your eyes, and this is the last thing I'm going to do. Sometimes my world's out of focus and rhyme and I just can't see your hand in the picture but I hear you saying child I'm still in control take my hand trust my plan and have no fear then I'm released to be what he wants me to be. I can relax in the flow of your spirit. 
I'm resting while growing and quietly knowing that you're working your purpose through me. Rest, rest in him. Your work is through. Just lean back on his great love. Let him work through you. Let's thank him for the peace of God that we can live in rest instead of stress. Thank you, Lord. God, your sweet, settled blanket and peace is settling over us right now, Lord. God, only you know how hard I have to strive and try to live there because of my own nature, God. But I want to keep striving. I want to keep being diligent, doing all these things that I've talked about and other things that you may show me that I can do, Lord, to enter in my spirit in that place of rest. We're never more happy as parents than when our children are at peace, when they're at rest, when they're settled and they're happy and they're content and they feel confident we're going to take care of them, Lord. And how you long for us to be there in that place of absolute contentment, rest and peace, knowing that you've got it all in control, all in control. You are large and you're in charge. In the name of Jesus, I plead the blood over every one of us, God, that you would teach us. Lord, we're not pretending like I'm teaching, but I'm not acting like i got it all together. I hope they got that. I still strive to enter into that place, God, and I fail many times. But, Lord, I'm going to keep striving. I'm going to keep pressing because I know you don't want us to live in stress. You want us to live in the rest of the Holy Ghost. You died to give us a place of rest and peace and settled contentment in your spirit, even in the middle of a storm. Lord, when I rode that boat on the Sea of Galilee and realized the disciples were stressed to the max, but you were sleeping, you had no concern whatsoever because you knew when it was time for you to wake up what you were going to do. You were going to stand up in that boat, the bow of it, and say to the elements that nobody but you can control, peace, wind, wave, lightning, and rain, be still. And God, you have a date marked on your calendar. Every situation that we may have written in my bag already for this year that I'm concerned about, God, you have a date on the calendar that you're going to step in. You're going to resolve. You're going to give answers. You're going to lead and guide and direct us. You do not want us living stressed, worried, anxious, nail-biting, afraid, and overburdened. You said, come unto me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest unto your soul. God bless you. Thank you so much.